in the second part of our video, we'll pick up uh, where Watson and Crick elucidated their structure of DNA. In their seminal 1953 paper published in Nature, they included only this one cryptic sentence about the possibility of DNA replication. It has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. Well, that will discuss how cells actually replicate DNA. We'll discuss a key experiment by Matthew Meselson and Franklin Stahl, which has been described by some people as a beautiful or the most beautiful experiment of molecular biology. And we'll talk in some detail about the enzymatic model of DNA replication. What Watson and Crick really meant in their cryptic sentence is a model for DNA replication called semi-conservative, which is shown here up in the first uh, line. What semi-conservative DNA replication means is that if you have a DNA duplex where one strand is complementary to the other, each strand then has enough information for the synthesis of a complete new daughter molecule. So if you unwound the DNA duplex, into its complementary strands, and each strand then served as the template for the synthesis of a daughter DNA molecule, then each of these daughter DNA molecules would consist of one parental strand and one newly synthesized strand. In other words, the parental DNA molecules are half conserved, semi-conserved, in each of the new daughter strands. A formal conceptual alternative is the conservative model, where after the replication of DNA, the two daughter strands consist of one full parental strand, this is a completely parental strand, and one completely new DNA, daughter DNA molecule. So it's called conservative because the parental or the original parental DNA molecule is completely retained or regenerated in the next generation. And then a third uh, conceptual model is that after or through the process of DNA replication, what ends up is that in each of the daughter DNA molecules, we end up with bits and pieces of old and new, or parental and newly synthesized DNA molecules in both of the daughter DNA molecules. So this would be a somewhat random distribution of parental and newly synthesized DNA molecules. So these models are easy to conceptualize but how does one experimentally test these hypotheses? Matthew Meselson and Franklin Stahl devised a really elegant way to test all three hypotheses. And they used a method that uh, is called density gradient ultracentrifugation. In this technique, they put into centrifuge tubes a solution of DNA in cesium chloride. And this is high-density cesium chloride, greater than 5 molar. And if they spin these tubes at very high speeds and generate extremely high g-forces, and in their experiment they used 140,000 times uh, gravity for 20 hours, under these extreme conditions, what happens is that the cesium chloride ions even though they are in solution, actually begin to migrate. They begin to sediment. So at the bottom of the tube, okay, we get the highest concentration of cesium chloride. And at the top of the tube, we get the lowest concentration of cesium chloride. And because we have a difference then in the concentration of cesium chloride, we now end up with a density gradient. Okay. 
where we have the lowest density at the top and the highest density at the bottom of the tube. The DNA molecules here also are sedimenting under these extreme g-forces and they will migrate in along the density gradient until they reach a point where the density of the DNA molecule exactly matches the density of the surrounding cesium chloride solution. So if you have DNA molecules with different densities, they will end up at different heights on the tube after ultracentrifugation. So this is how they actually executed their experiment. First, they grew their cells, their E. coli cells, for many generations in medium containing nitrogen-15. So nitrogen-15 is a non-radioactive isotope. Because it has an extra neutron, it is more dense. So a bacteria grown in nitrogen-15 is going to incorporate nitrogen-15 into their bases, and they will then have dense DNA. And because they've been grown for many generations, essentially all of their bases in their DNA will have this dense isotope of nitrogen and will have uniformly labeled dense DNA. Then what they do is they take these cells that have dense DNA and now transfer them so quickly to medium containing only normal nitrogen-14. So nitrogen-14 is lighter than nitrogen-15. And when the cells now replicate their DNA in medium containing nitrogen-14, the newly replicated DNA will contain nitrogen-14. So after they shift their cells from nitrogen-15 medium to nitrogen-14 containing medium, they collect cells at various times, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, 60 minutes, 80 minutes, which corresponds to also the number of generations. So under these conditions, their cells were doubling every 20 minutes. So at 20 minutes, they have doubled, all the cells have doubled once in nitrogen-14 containing medium, meaning they have replicated their DNA once in nitrogen-14 containing medium. After 40 minutes, they have doubled twice, so they have replicated their DNA twice. And after 60 minutes, they have replicated the DNA three times. And at 80 minutes, they have replicated their DNA four times, now in con nitrogen-14 containing medium. So at each of these time points, they collect the DNA from the cells and subject them to ultracentrifugation and see where the DNA from these cells at various time points where these, this DNA uh, is located along this density gradient and therefore infer what the density of the DNA from these cells is at various time points. So what this diagram shows you then is that at zero time, meaning cells have been growing in just in nitrogen-15, we will get this is where the uniformly N15 labeled DNA would band, showing a high density. Cells that have replicated the DNA exactly once in nitrogen-14 containing medium, their DNA all had an intermediate density. So it was distinctly lighter, had a lower density than all N15 labeled DNA. Now cells whose DNA had been replicated twice in nitrogen-14 medium contained the same intermediate density DNA as before, but now they contained an even lighter DNA. So this is all N15. So this is all heavy. This band then consists, well, okay, so uh, then we can infer that this band, the lightest band, and as we go to more and more generations, there's no lighter DNA. It's just that the proportion of this lightest DNA band increases, the proportion of this intermediate density DNA decreases. Okay. So this has to be all 
N14 label DNA. And then this intermediate density must be where half the DNA molecule consists of N15 and half of the DNA consists of N14. And this is what Meselson and Stahl thought this DNA would look like. That one strand would consist of the N15 labeled strand, and the newly replicated strand would be all N14, and that would give you intermediate density DNA. This is the actual data uh, that they published in their paper. And you can see here the generation zero. This is after one generation. And here is about two generations. It's 1.9, but close enough to two. Here is three generations and four generations, as in the previous figure. And you can see the shift. So this is dense. This is the bottom of the tube. This is the top of the tube on the left. So the most dense DNA. And you can see during the first replication of DNA, you can see the density of the DNA shifting and becoming lighter. So after one generation, they have only one form of DNA, which is distinctly lighter than the DNA that they began with. After two generations, we see the same band here of this intermediate density DNA, and then we see all new light DNA at two generations. And this all new light DNA persists as cells go to three and four generations, and also this intermediate density DNA persists through four generations. It just becomes less and less. Right? And here they put mixtures of zero and one generation, zero and four generation, to show that this isn't just sort of a, a creeping artifact. These DNAs actually do have different densities and that the positions of these DNA bands actually remain stable through their experimental conditions. And this is again another figure from their paper, which is their interpretation, that the original parental DNA molecule corresponds to this band here up at the top, that after one generation, according to the semi-conservative model, each DNA molecule would consist of one heavy and one light strand, therefore they would have intermediate density. You wouldn't get any other DNA. And this is what they saw, all intermediate density DNA here. And that after second generation, so let's think through this, what's going to happen. Each of these molecules are going to unwind. Okay? So we're going to have the same heavy DNA serving as a template for the synthesis of a new light DNA. So we're going to regenerate an intermediate density molecule. But now the, this light strand here is also going to serve as the template for the synthesis of another light strand. So at this point, after two generations, we will now have DNA molecules where both strands are N14 labeled or all light. And therefore, after two generations, we would see about half of the DNA being of intermediate density and half of the DNA being of light density, and this is exactly what they saw. So what we can see is that their results were exactly as predicted by the semi-conservative model, which is very nice. But the key is that their results also disproved or were completely inconsistent with a conservative model and with the dispersive model. And I want you to think about that and think about what results the conservative model predicted and what results the dispersive model predicted and how the actual data is inconsistent with the predictions from the alternative models. Now let's talk about the details of DNA replication and the enzymes. The enzyme that does 
DNA replication that makes DNA is called DNA polymerase. So polymerase meaning it makes polymers. You know, if it makes a DNA polymer, it's the enzyme that makes DNA. Now here is a key statement that I want you to remember. All DNA polymerases, regardless of whether they're from bacteria, eukaryotes, archaea, whether they're from viruses, all known DNA polymerases do the same thing. They add new nucleotides only to a pre-existing 3' hydroxyl end. Meaning, DNA strands on Earth are capable of growing only from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. This has very important implications for how cells replicate their DNA. And we'll get into some of the complexity in a uh, uh, subsequent slide. But for now, let's take a look in some detail at what DNA polymerase does. So here we show our template strand. And DNA polymerase is making the new strand. So you'll notice that it is making the new strand from the 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So a new nucleotide triphosphate, a new nucleotide, is going to be added to the 3' prime hydroxyl. Okay. So in this case, the template has an A base, an adenine. The correct complementary base was, is thymine in DNA. And so it's going to add a thymidine triphosphate. Now, thymidine triphosphate is just like ATP, except A is replaced with T. And like ATP, it is a high-energy molecule. And when the phosphates, the two terminal phosphates, are cleaved off, first as pyrophosphate, and then the pyrophosphates are hydrolyzed to uh, two molecules of inorganic phosphate, as shown here, that hydrolysis of phosphate provides energy for the DNA synthesis reaction. So that's where the energy for DNA synthesis comes from, from hydrolysis of phosphates and nucleotide or nucleoside triphosphates. And so the DNA polymerase then is going to read the template from the 3' prime to 5' prime direction. So it's going moving from left to right. So it reads template and proceeds along template 3 prime to 5 prime. Okay? So it's making DNA 5 prime to 3 prime, but it's reading the DNA 3 prime to 5 prime because the resulting duplex has to be anti-parallel. What this figure also shows you is that DNA polymerase, although this is rare, will actually make a mistake every once in a while. So here it's showing in, incorporating an A instead of a T with, you know, where the template has a C. So this is a misincorporation. DNA polymerase is with proofreading activity, and this is true of uh, all cells, are capable of recognizing this misincorporation or this mistake, and then they backtrack and remove excise the misincorporated base and then they put in the right base. So that's called a proofreading activity. Now I'm also going to tell you that DNA replication proceeds bidirectionally. Okay? So even though the enzyme DNA polymerase is able to make DNA in only one direction, when we look at DNA replication along a uh, molecule, what we see is that the replication factories, the replication complexes, move along the DNA in both directions. So how does that work? Well, first, uh, what we're showing is a double-stranded DNA molecule. This is our parent. And the first thing that has to happen is that
at specific points in the DNA called origins. So O stands for origin. This is the origin of DNA replication. The uh, DNA duplexes, the, the base pairing, is undone. And so these strands are able to separate because the DNA base pairing is undone. And in this uh, point of separation, we have DNA polymerase complexes, okay? DNA replication complexes. And there's two DNA replication complexes, one at each end. And each DNA replication complex is going to unwind the DNA. Okay? So we get unwinding at both of these sites. And this direction of unwinding is going to go in both directions. Okay. So in a eukaryotic chromosome, which is one very long, linear, double-stranded DNA molecule, when the cell goes into S phase, replication of DNA begins at multiple origins. Okay. So when you have multiple origins, each of these with that are uh, starting from an origin and unwinding DNA in both directions, what we can have is that the, uh, these replication, each of these is called a replication bubble, or sometimes called an eye, because it sort of looks like an eye. They can um, go along until they merge and these will also merge until you get two daughter DNA molecules. Okay. So what's happening is that the replication complexes are moving along the chromosome bidirectionally, but within each complex the DNA polymerase is making DNA, is able to make DNA in only one direction. So let's not confuse the movement of complexes and the unwinding of DNA in two directions. That's what we mean by uh, DNA replication proceeding bidirectionally. We, uh, but the DNA synthesis reaction itself can happen in only one direction. And this has some interesting consequences. So here is what we call a replication fork. like two roads uh, diverging in the woods, you get a, a, a replication fork. Okay? So this is DNA being unwound, and DNA is going to be unwound. The unwinding of DNA is going to go towards the top. And so at the point where DNA is unwound, we have a replication fork. Not form, okay. And at a replication fork, there are going to be two different DNA, well, two DNA polymerase enzymes. One here, and as we see, um, another one here. Okay. So these are the locations of DNA polymerases. So in the light blue is our template DNA. And the light green is the newly synthesized. So this is what we call our leading strand. In the leading strand, the DNA polymerase okay, is reading the template strand. This template strand has the directionality of 5 prime to 3 prime this way. On, along the leading strand, DNA polymerase is moving along in the leading strand template from a 3' prime to 5' prime direction. So it's tracking the movement of the replication fork. So this DNA polymerase is moving towards the replication fork. And it's able to read the template strand continuously and make the new DNA strand continuously from a 3 prime 
That's our three prime end from a five prime to three prime direction. So this is easy, it's the lead, le leading strand. This DNA polymerase is able to just follow along as the replication fork unwinds DNA. Now, what about the DNA polymerase on the opposite strand? This is called the lagging strand for a good reason. Here, in order for DNA polymerase to synthesize DNA from 5' prime to 3', prime, which is the only thing it can do, it doesn't have any other choice, yeah? it has to again read the template from a 3' prime to 5' prime direction. Okay, so it has to read the template away from the replication fork. It has to synthesize its newly uh, its new DNA away from the replication fork. Okay. So what it does is it it starts at one place and keeps synthesizing and then as the replication fork goes up it's going to come back to the replication fork and restart synthesis and head away from the replication fork. So along the lagging strand it synthesizes the new strand in fragments. Okay. So these fragments are called Okazaki fragments. And since it synthesizes um, the lagging strand DNA in, in pieces, then another enzyme has to come along and seal the mix and turn these fragments into one continuous DNA molecule. So here is the thing then. Because of the anti-parallel structure of DNA, and because DNA polymerases can only synthesize from 5' prime to 3' prime direction, it means that the two strands of DNA have to be replicated differently. The leading strand is easy. The lagging strand DNA has to be done in pieces with the DNA polymerase continuously backtracking towards the replication fork and then synthesizing away from the replication fork. This is a picture from Nature showing some of the uh, enzymology of how that does, how, how that occurs. Here are the DNA polymerases, the two DNA polymerase uh, enzymes at the replication fork. What this shows is that there is another enzyme that I would like you to remember called DNA primase. We'll just call it primase, okay? Primase. And what primase does is it makes a short segment of RNA. Okay? So it begins at the replication fork, and it's going to synthesize a short segment of an RNA molecule, which is complementary to the template strand. So this is all what's happening at the lagging strand. And it has to make an RNA primer because DNA polymerase needs an existing 3' prime hydroxyl. So the RNA primer provides a 3' prime hydroxyl that DNA polymerase can start adding on to. So here it shows DNA polymerase that has begun to add on to the end of an existing RNA primer. So then DNA polymerase and the lagging strand synthesizes away from the replication fork okay, until it meets, uh, comes to the previous RNA primer, and then it falls off. And then once it falls off, it's going to go backtrack and reinitiate DNA synthesis from the next RNA primer. Now, what's really hairy is that these two DNA polymerases are physically linked together. So then the only way that these physically linked together DNA polymerases can work together is for the lagging strand to loop out. Now this is really much more difficult than I can try to explain using just static diagrams and words. Fortunately the BioFlix video on DNA replication that's part of Mastering Biology does a wonderful job of showing uh, 
what's called a trombone model of DNA replication, which means that the lagging strand loops out, um, and, and this is how um, replication works in the cell. So here, um, I just want to show you, um, I hope you rewatch the uh, BioFlix video, uh, which kind of takes you through it in slow motion. The trombone model takes you through uh, the mechanisms of DNA replication in a stepwise fashion, so you can um, do that, step through that at your leisure. But I just want to show you this cool molecular visualization that shows it happening in near real time. Using computer animation based on molecular research, we are now able to see how DNA is actually copied in living cells. You are looking at an assembly line of amazing miniature biochemical machines that are pulling apart the DNA. There is the leading strand here at the and bottom, and there is the lagging strand, strand at the top. The DNA to be copied enters the production line from the bottom left. The whirling blue molecular machine is called helicase. It spins the DNA as fast as a jet engine as it unwinds the double helix into two strands. One strand is copied continuously and can be seen spooling off to the right. Things are not so simple for the other strand because it must be copied backwards. It is drawn out repeatedly in loops and copied one section at a time. The end result is two new DNA molecules.